Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Lucas? Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Thanksgiving early. We're so glad that you are here to worship with us on this exciting, wonderful High Sabbath. We're so glad that we're here. This is a very eventful day for us. We'll get into that uh, in a little bit, but I do want to share some announcements with you. I want to begin by welcoming back Pat and Jane Morrison to your home church. It doesn't matter where you are now or where you were before, this is your home church. And we're so glad you're here. Jane's going to be giving our children's story today, and Pat will be having our message. And it's just so nice to see them both here. They were pastors of College Church for like 47 years, something like that, I believe. Um, and I think, no, <laughs> uh, it, it was at 90, 96, 97 till 08, correct? And so, uh, so we're just, we're happy to have them back home uh, and uh, ministering to us today and, and fellowshipping with us as well. Um, in the prayer focus section of your bulletin, you'll see a, a section set called In Bereavement. And I just wanted to make note that the family, the pray for the family of Dr. William A. Jacobson. Many of you know Dr. Jacobson. Uh, he had a practice here in Lancaster for many years. And some of you may want to, um, to share some stories or remembrances. And there's an email there where you can send those. So we are um, asking you to keep the, you know, the family of Dr. Jacobson in your prayers today. Um, some things coming up, the Operation Christmas Child boxes, those are due today. You might have forgotten it. Uh, maybe it's back at home. Feel free to bring it later on today or um, tomorrow if you'd like. You can stop by and drop it off, but we need it today or tomorrow, the Operation Christmas Child boxes. Um, that would be great. Holiday Food Drive um, concludes today, and today is the exciting day. And that's when we deliver the holiday food boxes to the needy families throughout Clinton and Lancaster and beyond. That starts, I believe, at, um, let me make sure this is correct, 1 o'clock. Um, but if you need your boxes before then, feel free to stop by there and pick them up and, and check, with, um, check with Marge or Cheryl or whoever is down there. Um, and we do need your help today to deliver these boxes. It's so exciting to take a box or 10 because sometimes it's a huge family that has eight boxes of food or something like that. And you knock on the door and you deliver these boxes and, and uh, sometimes they're very welcoming and warm and you can pray with them and all that kind of thing. And sometimes not so much, but it's still a wonderful ministry. So we encourage you to be part of this, especially if you gave names and food boxes were put together for the names that you submitted. Remember, you need to be the one who delivers those boxes today uh, to the names that you submitted. So please keep that in mind as well. Also, uh, there will be at 3.30 today, kind of a remembrance time, a celebration time uh, for all those who participated in any way uh, it will be a little slideshow. Your face might be in there, much to your dismay. And uh, it should be a lot of fun. We'll have refreshments there. And then at 4.30, we need help, especially the uh, strong individuals that are out there. We need your help right at 4.30. The sun will be down by then. And we need to move all of the tables out of the fellowship hall into pickup trucks and take them right back to the conference office. And we just need to clear out the fellowship hall so we can uh, start getting it ready for the memorial service tomorrow, the reception. Um, as many of you know, tomorrow at two o'clock here in the sanctuary is the memorial service for our beloved Dr. Rick Trott. And uh, the reception will follow in the fellowship hall. So we need to get this place ready and we need some help with that. Uh, so please, if you're available, 4.30 today 
or uh, 9.30 a.m. tomorrow morning. That would be much appreciated. Um, there's some changes in the office schedule this week. Uh, the, there will be, uh, the office will be closed Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday because we follow the same schedule as the conference. So um, the only real day that it's going to be open is Tuesday. Um, so I might be in on Monday for a little bit, but Ed will be in on Tuesday. So we need bulletin submissions by Tuesday and all of that, please, um, by Tuesday. And let's see here. Um, there's more information about the Trop Memorial and how you can help with that. Also, Roger Bothwell's memorial will be next Sabbath, November 25th, 4 p.m. at the Worcester Airport SDA Church. Uh, things going on this week and not going on this week. I want to make mention that, um, that the Wednesday night Bible study will not be happening this week because of the holidays, but what will be happening this week is the turkey trot. And I have heard that it's a great way. I have heard because I've never done it. I don't know if I'm doing it this Thursday. I'm leaning more towards that that's not going to happen. But there are some of you that, are, that love to run or that would like to try a 5K. It's done right over here. So, am I pointing the right direction? I don't know. So at Dexter Drumlin, is it that way? Okay, Dexter Drumlin this way. Some of you know it as George Hill. And so meet there. You can park at the school. And uh, that starts right at 7.30 a.m. And, um, and, and, and have a wonderful time running a 5K before uh, we enjoy all of the delicious food that are traditions in many households. Uh, I also want to make mention that not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, Kari Radford will be in here decorating this sanctuary and the church for our holiday season, the Christmas season. And so she needs some help with that. A lot of her usual help in the decorating committee is not available. Um, so we need some help. And she would love it if some young adults were to come in and, and help with that as well. If you're in your 20s or so, come and help with that. But any age, it doesn't matter. Please help. And that is not tomorrow, but Sunday, November 26th at 10 a.m. here um, in the... Uh, in the sanctuary or in the church. Also, there's this insert, and again, we mentioned it last week, we want you to use this insert as an invitation. Hand it out to your neighbors, to your friends, to your co-workers. Let them know. We had such a great time last year, and again, it, all, it explains it here, but just in a nutshell, our fourth and fifth graders, and we haven't selected those yet, so if you're in fourth or fifth grade and you would like to be part of the live nativity, please come and talk to me personally. Let me know. Some of you have already done that. All right, so we'll have a live nativity right outside on the lawn, right by the tree. And then we'll come inside and we'll have some refreshments, some hot chocolate and cookies. And then we'll go back outside for the Christmas tree lighting. And then the Lancaster Fire Department, just like last year, will come in their big fire trucks and make a big old spectacle. The kids love it and give treats to the kids and all of that. It's just, it's wonderful. So we want the community to be invited. We want the community to come out. I believe Heather's working with the um, Lancaster Police Department. We may even block off Main Street so that community members can safely walk across Main Street and not worry about cars whizzing by. So we're expecting a big turnout. We want all of you to come for that. That is the first Sabbath afternoon of December, starting at 4 o'clock with the live nativity. And so that's the insert. Again, use this to invite friends and uh, co-workers, neighbors, all that type of thing. Um, I want to uh, finish uh, announcements with uh, these beautiful decorations here. We have some very large and heavy pumpkins, gourds, that sort of thing. Uh, we will have a processional today where uh, members of our church board and other leaders of our church will be marching down and, and grabbing the, some of these. Hey, if you're, you know, if you're a strong member of our church board or whatever, feel free to grab one of these huge pumpkins. That's fine. They'll come up front, and then we'll ask Patrick Morrison to pray a blessing, not only for these items, but for all of our Thanksgiving baskets so that they can leave our church today being blessed by the Lord. Um, but then afterward, Kari wants me to let you know if there are any other large pumpkins or anything up here that is left, if it's edible, please come on up and take it, take it home, decorate your home, 
cook it. I don't know how to cook these things, but you know, who am I? But if there are not, if there are decorations here that you cannot eat or consume, please leave them on the tables. But you're welcome to take whatever's left here on the table if there's anything left, no matter how big this pumpkin might be. All right, and happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. And we're so glad that you came here to worship at the College Church. Normally, we would have a hymn before this, but as there is no hymn, will you please stand for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for the opportunity to come here and worship you. Please bless the Thanksgiving baskets that they might get to the needy families who need them and that they might receive a blessing from us. Please bless everybody in the service. Help them to remember what they're supposed to say and for it to be a blessing to all of us. Thank you. Amen. There is an opening hymn, but we're just making it part of praise and worship time this morning. Hymn number 557, Come Ye Thankful People. been so good 
There's a little song that we used to sing back in the day, and we're going to sing it now. It's called, God is so good. He's so good to me. grateful heart. Lord, we thank you for in spite of everything that's going on, you are in control and you love us with your unconditional love. Give thanks. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy Give One. I say I loved College Church where I, or no, I'm saying Andrews University, PMC. I loved living there. That was my home church always. But this, I love, love, love College Church. It's great to be back. And kids, it's your turn. I'm so happy to be able to tell your story this morning. So go around. I think you still do that. Go around and collect not just dollars. Today's a special Sabbath, so $5, $10 bills, $25 bills. 
you know what. So hold your money up, folks, and kids, go collect. And those in charge of the churches, take your place. The other one's over there. And then come and sit up here for story time. I think we're going to have the story on this side today. So find a place over here. Hey, Andrea. I was trying to think of all the kids' names from when we lived here, and I thought, I'm going to call them all up. I thought, bad idea, I'm going to forget someone, but I'm seeing some of the bigger ones up here. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> new ones. And some of the visitor ones, Aaliyah. <laughs> hey, Georgia. Good morning. Caleb. <laughs> oh, you made it home, Mitchell. Pat, you're going to have to move the stuff over here. And he's gonna have to. Come. He's gonna have to come. Too. Oh wow! This is a lot bigger than the kids' first group that I tell children's story to at our church. This is cool, but I don't have the 14 and 21 year olds come up. <laughs> Caleb, it's a secret. It's the same story I told at your church when I was there, okay? I have a new one for next week, but I didn't have it quite learned. It's great to see you. I love children's story. Do you? Yeah. I see some still have their money. Do you know where to put it? Oh, well, we'll take care of that later. Oh, there's the church back there. If you want to go put it in. If you want to go put that $20 bill. I'm, I'm watching. <laughs> That was a 20. <laughs> cool. Well, our story this morning is about a little girl, Sarah. This happened years and years and years ago in 1948. That's the year I was born, so calculate the years, folks. Anyway, and Sarah was eight years old, and Sarah was sick, very, very sick. And her folks were trying to help her and hoping she'd get better at home because both her mom and her dad had both lost their jobs and didn't have any money. They really didn't have the money to spend to go to the doctor, so they were hoping she'd get well. But she wasn't getting better. So finally they took her to the doctor. And the doctor said, yes, Sarah is really sick. And I know, I think I know what could help her get better. It's kind of strange to say, but if she just had an egg every day, she needs the protein, that would help her get better. The doctor thought, well, that's easy enough, but his, her parents thought, we don't have the money to buy any eggs. We don't have the money. We've been living out of our cellar of canned vegetables and fruits that we had from our garden and that's kept us eating and kept us okay but we don't have money to go buy eggs but they went home and thought what are we going to do we've got to get Sarah better the neighbor came over and the neighbor said to mama let's pray so they prayed dear Jesus please please Help us to be able to get some eggs for Sarah so she'll get better. Amen. We, and they thought, too, we know we can trust in God. He takes care of us, doesn't he? And they thought, we have never heard a chicken on this road. We've never seen any chickens here. We've never heard a rooster here. There's no chickens around. But they remembered, we prayed, and we trust in God. And all of a sudden, give me an egg. All of a sudden, quack, 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 quack,
plane came a chicken and came right to their gate and stopped and laid an egg. <laughs> Want to hold it? It's pretty warm. That chicken just laid it. And cluck, 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 cluck. And off he went down the lane. She went down the lane. <laughs> just a little sidetrack here. I told this story once before, and I kept saying, he laid an egg. And my husband's sitting on the front row because he's preaching that day, and he's hollering, she laid an egg. And I'm oblivious, so I'm he laid an egg. Finally, the last one I did get right. But I'm going to get it right this time. Right, Maribel? She laid an egg. And oh, Mama was so thrilled. And she knew that God had watched over him because there were no chickens on their road. And so Mom took that egg and she maybe boiled it that day for Sarah. Is it a, she can keep holding it. It's, it is boiled. <laughs> and the next day, they thought again. That just happened yesterday. That was really cool that that chicken laid an egg. But can we really believe it's going to come back or someone's going to bring us an egg? And here it came again. Cluck, 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 down and came right in front of their lane and laid an egg right there. You're the lucky winner, Alyssa. And maybe they took... Mom maybe took that egg that day and fried it for her. She was trying to make it interesting. And so they kept giving her eggs. Because the doctor said, I think if she has an egg for at least seven days or so, I think she'll be better. Well, off the chicken went, down the lane. They didn't see it again the rest of the day, didn't hear from it, nothing. Where was that chicken coming from? They weren't sure, no. But the next day, she needed another egg, didn't she? So, buck, 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 came the chicken down, stopped in front of the lane. Amalia, you're the lucky winner. And the chicken laid the egg. It's warm, isn't it? It's hot. <laughs> and off it went. Well, that kept happening. And mom and the neighbor kept praying that every day there'd be an egg for Sarah. And there was, wasn't there? And mom would either boil it or fry it or poach it. What other ways can you do eggs? Scramble them? Yep. And that's what happened every day. Well, let's do one more day. <laughs> one more day. Down came that chicken. Buck, 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 Got to get over here to Gianna. <laughs> and it laid the egg right there. And off it went. Did you see that egg, Lucas and Lucas? <laughs> Whoa. They're warm, right? Cool. Well, that happened every day. And just like God does, he promises to take care of us if we trust in him. And she got better. Remember, Caleb? She got better. So we need to remember always to ask God for help and to trust that he'll take care of us. Let's have a prayer. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for all the promises in the Bible. And we thank you that we can trust in you to watch over us and take care of us. We love you so, so much. Amen. Thanks for coming up, especially you biggies. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It is now time for a prayer of the people. It's time for all of us to spend time with God. Those that are able may kneel. Those that would like to come forward, you're welcome to come forward.
our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day. This is truly a day of thanksgiving. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for being almighty. You are everything to us. If it weren't for you, we would have nothing and be nothing. We thank you for that, Lord. Lord, we thank you for being our Savior, our friend, our guide. Many of us are in need of support and help. And we thank you for guiding us. Lord, many of us are sad. We've lost loved ones. Lord, thank you for comforting us. Many of us are hungry and you have provided food and nourishment. You, Lord, take care of our every need. Lord, we ask you for those that are sick that you put the, your healing, that you heal them, that you put their arm, your arm around them. Today, we come with some special health concerns. Madeline, Bob, Dean, Linda, Ashley, Charlotte, Paul, Juanita, Stan, John, Joshua, Dylan, and Thor. Lord, we know that you know what their health concerns are and you have the power to heal them and we ask if it be thy will that you do that. We pray for the Jacobson family. We know that they are missing their loved one. We pray also for the Trot family during this time. And Lord, we know that you are the almighty comforter and you are providing that comfort. Continue to bless those in military service, Autumn, Robbie, Stephen, and Jonathan, Please keep them safe and bring them back to us safely. And Lord, we're blessed today to have Elder Morrison back with us. Speak through him, Lord. He is your servant. And Lord, finally, as we close, there are many of us with silent concerns that have come forward or blessings. And we take a moment now to hear them. Thank you, Lord for hearing our prayers. Amen. When you look at scripture in regards to giving, there's often a point that is missed. And that is, is that 
Giving is not just good for those we give to, but it's good for us too. And there's definitely an element in the blessing that comes from opening up our hands and not holding on to what we have, but letting it run through our hands to others as well. It's good for us. And during this time of Thanksgiving, we are definitely a culture of abundance. We have so much, and we have so much to give. And I hope we can keep that in mind, that as we are thankful for what we have, we are also thankful that we have the ability to give and that we do so. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for so many blessings. Thank you for the richness of our lives, maybe not just with money and things, but also with relationships and love and faith and community. Lord, please help us to give from the abundance of what we have and to open up our hands and not grasp it, but to let it run through. Thank you, Lord, in your name. Amen. The scripture today can be found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep you hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We thank God for his grace and his mercy every day. The song that we're going to do now is called Song of Glory. We first heard it sung by the group Ashmont Hill out of Ashmont Hill, Boston.
song simply says, Lord, please accept our praise. What we do, we do for you, Lord, because of what you've done for us.
had this view for a long time. <laughs> it was an era when the king, when the new king, came into power. His first task was to clear out any who might have kingly aspirations, ambitions, or who might know someone who would have such. It was a shock. It was a shock to me as a 21st century person to realize. It, it goes across my sensitivities to grasp that oftentimes this meant they thinned out their own family in order to set up their kingdom the way they wanted. And David wasn't heir to Saul's throne by family succession. You know that very well. But it was known that Father God had selected him to succeed Saul. David knew it, and Saul knew it. They were at war, one-sided war. Saul had gone from adoring David to actually hating him to death, and that isn't a figure of speech. He wanted David dead. Scripture records two occasions when David could have brought this war to an end for old Saul. He could have done it single-handedly, but he'd refused. He'd been a set aside by the Lord's prophet Samuel. He knew he was to follow Saul, but he refused to take the life of Saul because Saul was the Lord's anointed. And so he held back. He knew he was to be the king, but he still held back his people that he was with. Whoa. Whoa. They thought, listen, the Lord's put him in your lap. Do what you're supposed to do. The two occasions when David could have taken Saul out and set this whole thing up differently bookmarked the account that we're going to look at today. David let Saul get away just before we had this one. So today we find David and his little army escaping from Saul's authority. From his proximity, they're getting clear out of Saul's range. Samuel had just died. David thought it was a better part of judgment to put some distance between himself and Saul. He had just allowed Saul to escape. You remember that story, how Saul went up into the cave? We could put it more delicately, but he went up to relieve himself, and David and his whole troop were in the back of the cave. They could have taken him out. They didn't. But then after, soon after this, after Samuel died, David marched his entourage into the wilderness of Paran. Apparently far enough away he was he was off old Saul's radar. This was the first of the incidents, the ones that we talked about. The other f follows almost immediately after this. They're in the wilderness of Paran. It's familiar territory for David, not geography, but territory. He's talking about enterprise. David was in his element. He was amongst shepherds. He was amongst sheep and goats. He loved it, and he sponsored that love in his fellow men. They knew that David was, uh, uh, was very happy, and so they were happy for him. And they became a wall of protection for all of old Nabal's stock, the sheep and goats, thousands of sheep and goats. It must have been a piece of cake for David and his troop to look after all that, to surround it, to do what they needed to do to protect it from human and animal predators. I can imagine at night, though, you know, when the sheep are all resting and the shepherds, the ones who aren't right on watch, could rest. Can't you imagine around their fires at night that there would be some music once in a while? He could teach them a lot of new songs. David was quite a musician. And he had instruments. He made instruments. And so he might have, they didn't have this one. Maybe a harp, guitar-like thing, all kinds of instruments. Or can you imagine some of the shepherds could whistle when they're sitting around the campfire? Just to, while I heard a shepherd. Who was whistling? Where is that? All right, good enough. Yeah, you can imagine around that campfire, they would whistle, they would sing, they would teach them some new songs. I recall when I was in college riding in the back of a bus with a, I don't know what kind of tour it was. It must have been a, one of the choir tours. And Jerry Patton, who used to sing with the Heralds, the King's Heralds, he, he was with them a lot of years, so it went through all that. 
And he, he was teaching some of us. He was in college at the same time. He was teaching us, some of us, the endings of some songs, some tags. And so I can imagine that happening there uh, around the fire where David would teach these shepherds. And, and people sang quite a bit then. And maybe he taught them some new harmonies and some things. And can you imagine the uh, friendly contests that could take place? All of the sheep, all the shepherds didn't have to be out around the flock, and all of David's men, there were 600 of them, didn't have to be right on, on task. So can you imagine some of the times they sponsored some, um, some contests? Uh, how many of you ever did leg wrestling, where you lay on the floor and lift your leg and try to flip someone you did? I challenge, no, I'm not. I take that back, all right? And I especially wouldn't challenge your wife. Okay, she could beat me. Selena, I would challenge, no. All right. <laughs> Leg wrestling, all kinds of tussles, all kinds of things. And then, can you imagine when David sees one of those shepherds with his sling out, and David pretends. He says, now, what is that thing? What? What do, you, what do you do with that? He drags out this thing and he says, can you, can you show me? And the shepherd takes it and he swings it and he throws something. And, and then uh, David says, well, you think I could do that? And the shepherd says, well, see that? And he aims it. By the way, where's the clock? Uh, he sees something out there and he says, okay. And David says, well, let, let me try it. And he did Oh, and the guy says, oh, he just laughed at him. And David said, well, let's make this more interesting. How about if, okay? And then David reaches into his little pouch and he puts something in here. And he starts, uh, it, whoever catches this gets a prize, okay? Don, are you ready? He didn't catch it. And I wouldn't have thrown it. I don't pay this church's liability. But you can imagine in the daytime, they had fun. David made it interesting for those shepherds. And he loved being around them. He thought it was a good place to be. But now, now it's time for something. I have a good friend. A friend, when I first started teaching high school religion, which would have been about 74. How many of you were born? Nothing. Um, and George now is a shepherd, uh, is a sheep shearer. But it was time for sheep shearing. That was a very important time in the year for Nabal and his troops. And so David's group was there with the shepherds. Now, they weren't going to be taking part in the shearing. David didn't miss that part of the job. But there was a sort of an interesting, uh, interesting tradition, interesting cultural background. And that was that when it was this time of year, when it was shearing time, then it would be very natural for people to be very hospitable. And so David knew that since he'd been protecting Nabal's flocks all this time, he knew that it would be a good thing if he would just send some men over there and, and the men could come back with some stores so that they could have a feast. They could have a really, really good time. And, and David wanted to be sure this went right. And he knew the customs. He knew he was within, not just rights, he knew he was within custom to make the request. Um, so he sent 10 men with beasts of burdens over to Nabal's household to ask for some vittles to throw a party for his own troops. Simple request. He prepared his spokesman who would lead the troop. He gave him just the right speech to glean the appropriate response. He had no inkling there'd be anything but a positive response because that was just expected. We've been hanging around with your shepherds and have actually saved you a lot of money. Neither human nor inhuman predators have gotten anything near your flocks. How about it? Could you spare a bit of your plenty to provide a small feast for David's little army? And it should have rendered a quick, positive, generous response. That's what should have happened. Instead, the old fool, and that's what Nabal means, I didn't make it up, he didn't just deny their request, he insulted David's integrity. David, who is David? What, what are you, a bunch of runaway slaves? Get out of here. He, he didn't do it quite like that, but it was pretty close. He was denying a common courtesy. He was a churlish, ill-mannered, rude, boorish old cuss. 
And he didn't just deny the request. He insulted David. Wait till David hears about this. And the shepherds are on their way back. Let's cut Nabal a little slack for just a minute. Who is David? He possibly didn't know. He might have been just selfish enough that he hadn't heard. He's, it's a remote possibility he hadn't heard. Maybe he did know and was protecting himself and his family. Because if he knew of David and Saul's hatred for David, if he had heard of it, well, how, how rough could Saul be? 1 Samuel 21, if you want, I'm not going to read it because they, they've given me a limit here and I passed it, I think. Um, David, in 1 Samuel 21, David went to the town of Nob to see Ahimelech. He went to see the priest. He went to see the priest because he was on the run from Saul initially. Then he went to see the priest and the priest uh, was a little afraid that he was there. And the priest asked him, well, what, what would you like, David? David said, I have some hungry troops. Could you provide us some food just to get us on our way? And he said, no, I don't have any regular bread. And David said, well, what do you have? He said, well, I have the show bread. We're changing that out today. You could take that with just used, but it's, it's been blessed. If your men aren't clean, all my men are clean. They haven't been with women in any of this time. Yes, if you would provide that, and he did. And then David said, I don't have a, I don't have a weapon with me. Could you provide me a weapon? And he said, well, we have the stuff that you took from Goliath. Okay. And the, the hard part of this is found in verse 7. Now Doeg the Edomite, Saul's chief herdsman, was there. Doeg heard this whole conversation. Doeg thought there's something funny about all this. And so when he heard that David got away with a spear and a sword of Goliath. He put that in a safe place in his mind. David said, give it to me, and he took off. Then you go to 1 Samuel 22, and it says, then Doeg the Edomite, who was standing there with Saul's men, spoke up. And, they, and he described the whole thing that had happened at Nob. He said, Ahimelech consulted the Lord for him. He gave him food and the sword of Goliath the Philistine. King Saul immediately sent for Ahimelech and all his family who served as priests at Nob. When they arrived, Saul shouted to him, Listen to me, you son of Ahatob. What is it, my king? Why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me? And he went on and railed, just railed at this priest. Why have you encouraged him to kill me as he's trying to do this very day? Well, had David been trying to kill him, he'd actually let him go. But Saul was really in a mess. But sir, Ahimelech replied, if, is there anyone among all your servants as faithful as David, your son-in-law? Why, he is the captain of your bodyguard and a highly honored member of your household. This was certainly not the first time I consulted God for him. May the king not accuse me in my family's matter, for I know nothing at all of any plot against you. And then Saul just shouts, you surely shall die with your entire family. He shouted it out, and he ordered the people around him, the soldiers nearby, to go and take care of it. And they refused. They refused the king. They told Saul, no. But the Saul's men refused to kill the Lord's priest. Then the king said to Doeg, you do it. So Doeg, the Edomite, turned on them and killed them that day, 85 priests in all, still wearing their priestly garments. Then he went to Nob, the town of the priests, and killed the priest's families, men and women, children and babies, and all the cattle, donkeys, sheep, and goats. Now I say, Nabal should have known about this. Maybe, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he didn't. But he framed a pretty nasty response to David. He sent David's men back with an insulting report. And by the time they got back, they were tired, they were thirsty, and having failed, they couldn't wait to tell David the story. Because once they told him the story, they knew there would be something, there would be some action, something would happen. I don't know how far they got into the story before they're looking at David. And I wish I could find someone that would illustrate this for me, but when they looked at David and told him the story, the color from his neck started to go up and he looked like a thermometer. He turned redder and redder and redder 
and redder, and his face became just plain fearsome. He likely, right then, selected one of those who had just come back because they were tired. You, you take 200 of these men, and you can look after the camp while we're away. And the rest of the 400, he says, I want you to get all your weapons. We're going to march right now. Grab your weapons. This old fool won't have a male left in his household when we're through with him. His men, now they'd enjoyed the songs. They'd enjoyed the contest. But the idea of the excitement of a conquest and going to this household, that really got them fired up. It had been nice in the camp, but now it was going to get exciting. David hadn't been particularly judicious in explaining what he wanted from his men. In fact, the shepherds were all around when they heard him shouting out, you do this, you get that ready, we're going to march, let's go, we're going to get him. Now the shepherds. I've described Nabal a little bit. He's the old fool, and he lived up to his name. Do you think the shepherds liked him? They liked employment. As soon as David was out of sight, the leader of the shepherds selected a couple of the men who had been involved in those races where the contest through the day, he invited a couple of them to take off running. You better get to the household. You get there before David's army gets there, or there'll be some real trouble. And so they took a quicker route. You'd take a different route for an army of 400 than you would just a couple of men running cross country that knew the countryside. They definitely motivated. So fast forward. We get them to the camp. They went right to the front door, which ordinarily you'd stand out by. If there was a gate, you'd stand out a ways and you'd hail the people in the house and say, uh, hey, we, we need to talk to you. But in this case, they went right to the door. It was too urgent a a message they had to mince words. They blurted it out. As soon as Abigail came on the scene, they blurted it out. Uh, Chapter 25 of 1 Samuel, verse 14. Meanwhile, one of Nabal's servants went to Abigail and told her, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, but he screamed insults at them. These men have been very good to us, and we never suffered any harm from them. Nothing was stolen from us the whole time they were with us. In fact, day and night, they were like a wall of protection to us and the sheep. You need to know this and figure out what to do, for there's going to be trouble for our master and his whole family. He's so ill-tempered, no one can even talk to him. They were talking about her husband. He's so ill-mannered. And probably she would have corrected him sometime earlier, but she caught the message. And she went to action right away. It didn't cross her mind to correct them for the way they were talking about Nabal. She knew the score, and she knew of David. What kind of cave would you have had to live in to be secluded in not to have heard of David? All the women anywhere near Saul's kingdom knew about David. She knew also that a battle wouldn't bode well for her household. It wouldn't be a good thing. So she started barking orders. And even that totally beat shepherd who delivered the message responded to the urgency. You get the donkeys, you go with him. You go get the food tent and grab 200 of the large loaves of bread. I don't care what he has in mind for those loaves of bread. You get them and get here back here as quickly as you can. And you, you start packing up 100 raisin cakes. Get them together. I hope it's enough. Oh, Two skins of wine, please. I suspect they might, you know, the, the biblical wine could be either concentrated to where you mixed it with water, or it could be just straight juice. But in this case, when she, since she said two large skins, I suspect it was pretty concentrated stuff that they could mix to make for the whole army. And I don't care what he has in mind for them either. I doubt he'll even miss them. Oh, and call the butcher, find two of the finest sheep we have, and prepare them, get them ready post haste. We have no time to waste. And as soon as the donkeys get here, you start loading. And then she oversaw the loading, instructed those loading the donkeys how to take care of it. She said, you head on out, and I'll be right close behind. They couldn't relax. Nobody could until a mission was accomplished. They knew the exact route it would take for an army of 400 to march from where the camp was to to here. Abigail took just enough time to freshen up. She was on her way to meet royalty. She couldn't go the way she looked right now. So she got herself looking pretty good, and then she headed out. 25, verse 20, as she was riding her donkey 
into a mountain ravine. She saw David and his men coming toward her. David had just been saying, a lot of good it did to help this fella. He protected his flocks in the wilderness. Nothing he owned was lost or stolen, but he's re repaid me evil for good. May God strike me and kill me if even one man of his household is still alive tomorrow morning. As she was riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, she saw David and his men coming toward her. Now it's up to her what she do. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey, bowed low before him. Bowed low before him. She fell at his feet and said, I accept all the blame for this matter. Did Abigail have any of the blame for this matter? You can shake your head this way or that way. It's okay. Did Abigail have any of the blame for this matter? She did not, did she? Please, please, David, listen to what I have to say. I know, she's talking about her husband now, I know Nabal is a wicked and ill-tempered man. Please don't pay any attention to him. He's a fool, just as his name suggests, but I never even saw the young men you sent. So she's preparing the way. Now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, since the Lord has kept you from murdering and taking vengeance into your own hands, let all your enemies and those who try to harm you be as cursed as Nabal is. And here's the present that I, your servant, have brought to you and your young men. Please forgive me if I've offended you in any way. Once again, did she ask, need to ask David's forgiveness for anything? Just for her husband. The Lord will surely reward you with a lasting dynasty for you're fighting the Lord's battles and you have not done wrong throughout your entire life. Even when you're chased by those who seek to kill you, your life is safe in the care of the Lord your God, secure in his treasure pouch. But the lives of your enemies will disappear like stones shot from a sling. When the Lord has done all he promised and has made you leader of Israel, don't let this be a blemish on your record. Then your conscience won't have to bear the staggering burden of needless bloodshed and vengeance. And when the Lord has done these great things for you, please remember me. Now, this is important. When the Lord has done these great things for you, please remember me, your servant. Hmm. What's just happened here? Often, in the preparation of a sermon, you would make a premise, you'd make an introduction, and then you'd make your points, then you'd summarize what you'd said, and then you'd come with a conclusion, some kind of an action you would ask for. But I've done this backwards. I wanted to have a narrative sermon today, and then I wanted to take an inductive approach. After hearing the story and empathizing with Abigail and the shepherds, what have we discovered? There's a lot. We won't take time. The leaders are already preparing for this beautiful processional I'm looking forward to. Was David's anger and response what we're used to seeing in David? Was his response what we're used to seeing when he let Saul go those times? No. Just before this incident, he had his arch enemy in his clutches and, and made a point of letting him go because Saul was the Lord's anointed. Now he's asking for the, after this rascal with a vengeance unbecoming of a king. How is his plan foiled? Now listen carefully. How is his plan foiled? By the wiles of a cunning woman? No. By the inspired logic of a rational woman? Ah, I like that better. Real question, was the Holy Spirit active in this account even though not mentioned? Was the Holy Spirit active? Was the blame Abigail accepted here hers in any form? No. Is there a salvation message in there somewhere? Uh -huh. Was she reminded David, reminding David that his only hope for success now or ever was to trust in God to move forward? Yeah, trust. Trust in God. God, it's huge. We face things in our lives sometimes where we need to trust God because they don't make sense any other way. Trust God. Trust God. 
Nabal's disrespect was not David's to avenge. There's more to the story. Having calmed down and charmed David to death, he saw her beauty, he saw the beauty of her person, she delivered a bountiful feast, Now she had to head home to the potential wrath of her husband, a scorned husband. Think about that. Think about the era in which this took place and the role a husband could have. She would need all of the tact and faith and trust she had exhibited here with David to confront her husband at home. Women, I want to ask you in particular, if you're on your way home, and you have to confront this husband, did she rehearse what she would say when he inquired about her whereabouts? You think so? Think she might have tried to have something in mind? Did, Did she prepare what she would say if he discovered the loss of food that he had set aside for his extravagant feast or or the wine? It was a different era. Did she even fear retribution from from such a vile and ill-tempered man? He had a lot of weapons he could pull out of his quiver with this. What about the depleted rank of servants available to serve at his feast since she had taken so many with her? Could that be upsetting? Yeah. What went through the minds of the servants who had seen her in action? They were grateful. Of course they were grateful. She'd preserved their lives. They knew that. Now, you know the story. This isn't a new story to you. Hallmark could have written the book of this one. How many of you this time of year tune in on a Hallmark movie? Come on, man, raise your hands. Roger, I know you do. Oh, he said, no, not if it's football. Okay. When she got home, hallelujah, hallelujah, David was already too drunk to care about anything, and usually she would be so angry and so embarrassed for his behavior, but now she's relieved because he's drunk. She didn't have to waste a bit of her breath on him tonight. She would have been incensed under normal circumstances. How embarrassing, but in the morning, in the morning, cool, calm, and collected. Though he had a headache, so what? Cool, calm, and collected Nabal. Do you have any idea what almost happened here yesterday? He was now sober enough to grasp the significance of his haughty words yesterday to Abigail's horror. She didn't like him much right now, but to her horror, his face turned ashen and he stroked out. He lay in bed ten days before the Lord struck him and he died. Now the rest of the story is the stuff of fairy tales. Abigail sent word to David of Nabal's death. David rehearsed in his head again the beauty inside and inside of this special woman, and he sent a messenger immediately inviting her to become his wife. Now there's a people a lot smarter than I am who know much more about David's era than I do who make it clear he wasn't stretching propriety to make this request, to make this proposal. And she wasn't out of bounds to accept. Trust God. It's too simple, yet profound. That would have been had we started out with the concept, trust God. Trust God. Our hymn of dedication is 104. 104. My shepherd will supply my need.
نیستی Pray with me. Father God, for this beautiful symbol of the bounties that we all experience, we thank you. We thank you at this time of year when we have it to share, and I pray that you'd bless us with the spirit of thanksgiving, that it would go from here today, and your love would go with each box that goes out from here to each family that's blessed. Lord, we pray that Jesus will be in clear focus as folk receive these bounties. Lord, we pray that, uh, that something very special will come of this. Lord, we pray that you'll bless these folk who've brought these pieces forward. Give them your special blessing too in this season of the year that they'll sense they represent you and that they will be clear reflections. Bless each one of us that would be clear reflections of who you are and that the spirit of gratitude and trust that we have in you will just fill us so full it spills all over those around us. Now arise, shine, for your light has come, the glory of the Lord rises upon you, the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Amen. <laughs>